Hi, I'm Rich James. I'm a technology lead at Nationwide Building Society, and I'm here to talk about how risk adverse enterprises can adopt bleeding edge technology in a safe way whilst reaping the benefits of being early adopters. I'm going to tell the story through the lens of one team that went on a journey to the cloud and talk about some of the techniques we employed along the way. So this talk, uh, I've divided it into four sections, playing catch up, pioneering some of the results of our, of our efforts, techniques and buy-in. Just a level set, what do I mean by bleeding edge? So essentially technology that is so new as to be unproven. The logos are picked, a subset of the tech that we've worked with in an unproven beta or preview state. Situation 2018. <laughs> so we worked in a very gray building, admittedly not that gray, um, but we did have all of the things you would associate with a dull gray picture like that, which is manual deployment, basic on-prem infrastructure. We had no test automation. Um, it, it wasn't the most inspiring environment that was going to attract new talent, uh, but that was all about to change. And, and that is, in fact, the sole reason that I joined Nationwide. We had a big digital transformation starting and not just agile. It was cloud. It was DevOps. It was a pivot to insourcing and building our own teams and capabilities. And thankfully, our offices were also getting a makeover. So the team in question, they were building uh, or rebuilding our vast website estate. Uh, so we had many, many thousands of pages of quite often junk um, content because it had just grown organically and people had lost track of what was where. It was becoming a conduct risk. So as well as the, the, the underlying technology problem that we had, we had an experience problem. I'm going to focus now a little bit on the technology. So we, we actually wanted to move from having multiple CMS instances uh, to, a, to a single headless CMS, so decoupled by our APIs from monolith to microservices, virtual machines to Kubernetes, on-premise to cloud, web forms to React, and you know, manual deploys to DevOps, full automation. At the same time, we had another team building out a, a design system called the Nationwide Experience Language. This was a React-based design system that we now use for all of our web experiences. And so when we set out to build our new headless infrastructure, we wanted to use that same design system. So we looked at, uh, at some new technology, which was Sitecore's uh, JSS SDK, which was the JavaScript SDK, which enables you to split apart the content delivery uh, from content presentation. So the server-side rendering of your content could be a standard React application and the headless content from APIs uh, would come from the kind of enterprise CMS that our content editors were used to working with. So standard request response architecture, but decoupled with uh, headless content. So we moved on to a full implementation and we started with a single region deployment. Um, we then moved on to think about our microservice architecture. So what does it need to look like beyond the front end and the content management side of things? How are we gonna structure our, our microservices um, and, and and what would that look like? So the back end for front end pattern was commonplace at the time. So we started to review that. We quickly realized that with a componentized UI of a CMS based website, um, you know, you might have a back end service for a, for a component or widget, and you might have many of those on a page and your content editors are, are, are effectively empowered to put multiple components on a page. So you can quickly have a, a position whereby your content editors can create a very chatty interface. Um, so we didn't want that. That wasn't going to be a, a great user experience, specifically on mobile. Um, and one way to solve this, uh, it's rather an elegant um, trade-off of the BFF pattern, is to use a, a GraphQL server where you have one single round trip. And so we set about productionizing Apollo GraphQL for, for our use case. So Apollo, uh, it was spun out of Facebook in around about 2015 as an open source project. It's very mature. So that was a cutting edge API technology choice for us, which we de-risked with a mature implementation. 
Um, this burger comparison is one of my favorites. It really shows you the power of GraphQL and what you can do with it. You get what you ask for and in the order you ask for it in. So tying that back to the original problem statement, so the analogy would be that you're getting your bun from the bakers, your burger from the butchers, but the front end doesn't care. Like you don't care when you go to a restaurant, right? So our internal NFRs for critical services stated that we had to meet greater than four nines for our website. Therefore, we had to build multi-region. And when you look at what that means from a cloud infra DevOps perspective, blue-green deploys, databases, et cetera, we realized this was going to get very complex. And being an enterprise, we are, of course, using Azure landing zones for multi-subscription environments and following a hub-and-spoke model. We had a problem. Our cloud platform team didn't have the funding to deploy all of our shared hub services to multiple regions, at least not in the timescales that were going to that we were working to. Another issue that we bumped into the regulator, the PRA. So we told the regulator that we would build multi-cloud, that we would meet our resilience targets for you know, our, our platinum services that we would be able to demonstrate portability in a stressed exit scenario, that we would test our disaster recovery. So we put our heads together and started to think about how are we going to do all of this if we've only got a single region of compute? And that's where we decided to look at alternatives like Jamstack 